Good morning. How are you all doing today? I'm Pastor Matt Litchfield, First Apostolic Church of Truth and Love, where we will teach the truth of the Word of God and where we will love you to life. We want you to have a new life in Jesus. Amen. We want you to enjoy the bountiful blessings that God is preparing for you. Let's open up in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, I just thank you and praise you today, Lord. I lift up your name and give you glory and honor in all that you do. Lord, I thank you in everything, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the valleys we have to go through. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the mountain peaks you set us on. Lord, I pray that this message, Lord, would not return void, but Lord, would touch the hearts of those that are tuned in, those that are listening. Lord, I pray that you would go forth and minister under their hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray for this world, Lord Jesus. I pray for our elected officials. I pray for our police officers. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd bring racial justice to our society, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would take perfect control over every situation. Lord, I know that I may not be able to accomplish the things that I desire, Lord Jesus, unless you, Lord, are in it, unless you, Lord, desire it. Lord, I know that you desire, Lord Jesus, to take care of your people. Lord, I just thank you and praise you today, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that this message, Lord, would hit at the hearts of those that are listening. Lord, to minister to them, to encourage them, Lord, to strengthen them, Lord, to bring them back, Lord Jesus, if they've walked away. Lord, I thank you and praise you this morning, Lord Jesus. Have your way, Lord, in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God is faithful to us all the time. Um, if you could turn in your Bibles this morning to Exodus chapter 15, we're going to read verses 22 through 27. It said, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness, uh, the wilderness of Shear. Sure. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statues, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. The pathway of God often leads us through dry places. We often have to go through the deserts of Mara to re reach the pinnacles of Mount Sinai. We should not assume that just because we're going through a dry spell, that we have missed his leading when we find ourselves in those troubled places. You see, God sometimes has to take us through the desert. He sometimes has to take us through the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. Some of our greatest victories come when God leads us through those dry places. When it seems that nothing is going right. When it seems that you cannot get an answer from God. When it seems like there's a disconnect. You must continue to believe God is there and cares and hears. Do not Grow weary. Do not be become distressed, but instead put your trust and your faith in Jesus. Amen. I want you to remember that God is at his strongest when we are at our weakest. 
He can do the most with us when we admit that we are frail, that we are human, that we are weak, that we need his help. When we are able to admit that, hallelujah, he is able to lead and to guide us. He's able to take us to a newer height, closer to him, to draw us near. When we must rely God, he has our complete attention. He can bring us to another dimension. He can lift us to another plane in our walk with God. Amen. He can make it so that we can draw nearer to him than we ever have before. When a child falls down and scrapes their knee, they hold tight to their parent because they know their parent is going to give them comfort. They know that their parent is going to tell them it'll be okay. It'll hurt for a little bit. But then it's going to heal, and it'll be okay. You see, it's talking about Jehovah Rophi in this uh, portion of Scripture. The Lord who healeth thee. Amen. I want you to think in verse 25, that tree that he put in the bitter water to make it sweet represents the cross. Amen. We are living in a sinful life. We have bitterness in us. We, we, we are, are suffering from the bitterness of sin that we are born into when we are born in this world. Oh, but the cross brings a sweetness of salvation. It brings us a sweeter life in Jesus if we will just accept what God has done for us. Statue and ordinance is symbolic of the healing waters. Obedience to God would provide healing for the nation. So if they would follow after God's commandments, if they would follow after his statutes, if they would listen and then they would follow them, much like we are called to follow the commandments of Jesus in the New Testament, that's what the apostles spoke on when they, they spoke on, on the things of God. If we were, uh, if we were to follow those in, in this testament here, Israel, follow my commandments. Give ear to them. Hear them and not just hear them, but be doers of my commandments. Keep my statutes. And if you do that, I will keep your nation whole. I will heal your nation. Nobody will get the diseases that the Egyptians, your former slave masters, they will they get these horrible diseases, but I will keep you protected. I will heal your land. A season of rest often follows our time of testing. God is not unfaithful. He is not unjust. When we go through a test, He's looking for us to lean upon him, to lean upon his strength, to lean upon his all-knowing power. Amen. And when we can learn to lean upon the strength of the almighty God, instead of trying to do things ourselves, we will make it through every situation. Our dry spell will turn into an overflowing wellspring of life. Abundance will be ours, and we will be able to do the mission or the will that God has called us to do. So we have to have this time of rest, and God recognizes, I can give them rest. They've gone through the test. They've passed through the fire, and they succeeded because they relied upon me. They came to me. They recognized that I am their God. I am Jehovah Rophi. The Lord that healeth thee. Amen. I apologize if I'm pronouncing the, the, the Rofi wrong, uh, but I'm doing the best I can on some of these words. I know that not every word is easy to pronounce. Um, if you would go to 2 Chronicles 7.14, this is a scripture that is uh, very uh, popular to see right now on Facebook, but it's a scripture that's hit home to me for many years now. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land, heal their land. 
All right? I want you to think about this. We are constantly blaming the world for all the trouble that's in the world. We are often saying, this is happening because look how sinful and horrible the world is. And don't get me wrong, I do believe God tries to get the attention of the world. But I want you to listen to this scripture. It says, if my people, that's the people that are saved, that have come to the Lord. If my people, which are called by my name, Jesus, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their nation. You see, it starts with the church, folks. Saints of God, it starts with us. The church has been so busy nitpicking at each other. They've been so busy harping on each other. Instead of dwelling together in unity, as we were called to do, we were called to be in one mind, one accord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But no, we're so busy fighting with each other that we are detracting from what God has called the church to be. And we're so busy focusing on all the flaws of the world and the flaws of the fellow saint of God instead of focusing on our own walks with God and focusing on lifting each other up and exhorting one another that we, in our own way, we have done wickedness. So you see, when you constantly tear down brothers and sisters in the Lord, that is wicked. That is against the word of God. We are to exhort. We are to lift up. We are to encourage. Amen. So when we as the church learn to bind together in unity and we humble ourselves and recognize that while we have been blessed to find this salvation way, we are not perfect and we are not God. We are called to be witnesses for Jesus. We are called to deliver the salvation message. We are delivered to give them the good news is what we are told to do. But we are not to be tearing one another down. We are not to sit here and, and, and constantly fuss and gripe at the world instead of offering them what we have already received. We are to go forth and witness and to share, to be a light in this dark world. You see, the world already has all the fighting. So, so that's not going to attract them. They need to see the light of Jesus, the unity of the brother and sister in the church. Amen. Stop fighting. Turn from our wicked ways. And the Lord will heal our land. You want to see the United States see a, a, a better racial harmony? You want to see less crime in the U.S.? You want to see our lands healed? How about we try giving it to God for a change instead of trying to do it ourselves? You see, when we try to do things ourselves, we often make things worse than they need to be. Can I get an amen out there? Is somebody understanding what I am saying? It doesn't say in this scripture, if the world will humble themselves, it says, if my people will humble themselves and call on my name. The world doesn't have the name of Jesus yet to call on because they haven't received him. They haven't accepted him. They are not where we're at. But this scripture says, if my people, which are called by my name, it starts with us. It starts with the church. It starts in our homes, folks. We must understand that. He is looking for us, the church, to repent of our wicked ways, our self-righteousness, our judgments, our self-centeredness. He wants us to get rid of that. He wants us to lay it back at the altar. And he wants us to repent of the ways that we have acted. He wants us to return to him humble and ready to follow after his way. He will heal our nation. 
We must return now to faithfulness in prayer and fasting in the word. We must return to being unified as the church. Amen. We must get back to serving the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and body. Our churches have become consumed with a spirit of self-exaltation and self-righteousness and self-centeredness. They have become houses of judgment instead of what God called them to be. A house of prayer, of forgiveness, of healing, of reconciliation. You see, the church is a hospital for those that are imperfect, those that are hurting, those that need healing in their life, those that need to be forgiven. It's a place of prayer. God said, we'll call it my, I will call my house a house of prayer. He didn't say I'd call it a house of entertainment. Too many of you out there are trying to win the lost with entertainment. And while you might see a, a, an immediate boost through that entertainment, what are you going to do to keep them entertained? Because God doesn't need entertainment to win the lost. God requires truth. He requires humility. He requires us to be the light that is visible in this world. But he does not require us to come up with entertainment to draw them in. You see, when you begin to entertain the world, in case you ain't looked at Hollywood, my friends, in case you ain't looked at the music industry, my friends, when you begin to entertain the world, they are never satisfied. They want a bigger stunt. They want more violence. They want more sexual immorality. They want more uh, vulgar language. It never stops. It keeps going. Well, in the church, when you begin to entertain, they are going to wait for you. They are going to want you to start to change the method of entertainment. They are going to look for you to incorporate a more worldly compromise into it. And when you don't, they will walk away. Because you see, you cannot entertain people with the world. You must win them through the power and the might of the Holy Spirit. Jesus must be able to minister to them. He is the one that will make the change in their heart. Now, I'm not against Easter plays. I'm not against Christmas plays. What I'm against is the churches that have become so self-involved in entertainment that every service is an entertainment. Every service is about entertaining the congregation. You, as a pastor, are not called to entertain. The church is not called to entertain. We are called to be active participants in the church. Each and every member of the church has a place and a purpose. Humble ourselves and recognize we need to allow God to do the work. We have become prideful. We say, look at me, I'm so holy. I don't know how that person over there walks around looking like that, but I'm holy. Look at me. Well, you just lost your holiness when you kept saying, look at me and how holy I am. You're no more holy than the bum on the street drinking out of a wine bottle. You're consumed with your own self-pride and ego. I would advise you to get to the altar and repent of your wicked ways. You say, Pastor Litchfield, what are you saying? Are we not supposed to be holy? That's not what I'm saying at all. We are called to be holy for God is holy. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. We are called to be holy. We are called to live a righteous life. What we are not called to do is be self-righteous, prideful, self-centered, egotistical in our actions and in our thoughts. I see apostolic women that preen over their hair for four hours before a service, but spend 10 minutes giving God prayer and thanks. I see men in the apostolic ranks that will sit there and they'll spend an hour getting themselves ready for church, but they can't spend five minutes or 15 minutes in prayer. They've never fasted. They don't get into the word. But they're saying, look at me. When you're focused on saying, look at me, your walk with God is shallow. Your walk with God is about you and not about God. Amen. 
I'm not here to preach against holiness because as I've said before, I believe holiness is a necessity. What I'm here preaching against is that self-centered spirit, that prideful spirit that too many in our apostolic ranks have in their selves. We spend so much time lifting up and elevating people to a position where we almost make them like they're a god. Let me be very clear. There is one God and Jesus is his name. Hallelujah. Oh, I know there's someone out there that's hearing this message. And I know there's someone out there that's feeling conviction right now. I know there's someone that's never heard and says, there is somebody that is preaching what I've always thought. You see, we can't have the world thinking we're self-centered. We can't have the world thinking it's all about us. Because it's about our Lord and Savior. It is about Jesus. We have to win the loss, folks. If we want to see peace in the land, if we want to see any kind of comfort for our, our country, we need to humble ourselves. Jehovah, Rofi, the Lord who healeth thee. Do you have something that you need to have healed in you? Humble yourself before the Lord. We often forget that we are nothing without Christ. Without him, we would not be able to receive the new birth salvation. We would not be able to be born again into a wonderful birthright. Amen. From the apostolic perspective or the New Testament church perspective, the message of God's forgiveness is encompassed in Acts 2.38. And as a apostolic we know this scripture because we hear it all the time. And while we quote it a lot, it is not the only scripture referring to this. But it said, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Friends, there is no name more powerful than the name of Jesus. And the gift of the Holy Ghost is free. You can't do any kind of work to receive it. All you can do is lay down your sins self-will and your pride and the sinful lifestyle and say, God, I give you control over my life. God, I want you to fulfill in me the will that you have for me, the plan that you already designed for me. God, fulfill it in my life. And all of a sudden you will find yourself, you'll be telling God how much you love him, how much you praise him, how much you appreciate him. And then the power of God will fall on you and you'll begin to speak in another tongue. It's not something you taught yourself. It is something God gives to you freely. Amen. From Chronicles post-exilic viewpoint, God's promise to heal the land would have been the restoration bomb as they rebuilt the temple and the city walls. So for us, healing the land is receiving salvation and, and, and our, our neighbor getting saved and our, our lands getting healed through each person that comes in to the Lord. In, in this time of Chronicles, the post-exilic viewpoint, God's promise to heal the land was the, the healing bomb of them rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the city walls, regaining their identity. You see, a Christian's identity is Christ. That's why he's called Christian. Christ is our identity. If the world can't see Christ in us, we need to figure out why. What are we not doing that they can see Christ? Amen. This was their protection. This was their ark of safety. The temple and their city walls. God was providing them safety. A place of sanctuary. A place where they could get close to him and get right with him. And heal their land and heal their lives. And just as the church today should be the ark and a place of safety and healing. A place for us to draw nearer to God. The church is not a place for people to come in and receive condemnation. It is not a place for the lost to come in and, and, and receive uh, bitterness or hatred. 
The church is a place to come in for reconciliation to God. It's a place to come in to receive healing in their lives. It's a place for them to come in and receive salvation and for them to have a place of safety. A lot of people say, well, I don't need to go to church to be saved. You know what? You can get saved without ever setting foot in the church. But it is important in your walk with God to be a part of church, to go to the building to go and meet with other like-minded Christians and have service because it exhorts you and it lifts you up and it encourages you. And we are all called to have a shepherd in our life. Your shepherd in your life may change over the course of your walk with God. The person that you came into the church under may pass away. You may have a new pastor, a new shepherd that has to take over. But understand all of us need to have a shepherd. Pastors have a shepherd. Pastors have someone they go to, that they talk to, that they ask for advice. Because they don't have all the answers. Let's look in 1 John chapter 3. And verses 1 and 2. Or, I'm sorry, let's look at... At let's look at uh, the third epistle of John, chapter 1, and verses 1 through 2. The elder under the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosperous. In other words, he wants his physical health to be good. He wants his spiritual health to be great also. Okay? He wants the physical health to match his spiritual condition. So, he's saying, I want you to be physically healthy. And I want your spiritual condition to continue in the strength that you have. Matthew 9, 2. Matthew chapter 9, verse 2 said, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Amen. He saw their faith. And he said, your sins are forgiven. To obey takes faith. And if you have faith, you'll want to obey. Because if you have faith, you recognize that the will of God and the facts of the word of God are true and holy. Faith that God exists. Faith that God is our Savior. If you believe those then you're going to do all you can to serve the Lord with all your heart. It takes faith to be healed. And you say to me, Pastor Litchfield, why is it that I pray sometimes for people to be healed and they don't receive healing? God knows the reason. We don't always know the reasons, and it's not for us to know the reasons. But trust me, if they're not healed, it's because God has a plan and God understands already. And as hard as it is to do, we need to put our trust in God in that situation. We need to have faith. But it doesn't mean that you can't pray and ask God, God, help me to get through this situation. God, help me to understand. God is faithful. He's a comforter. He will, he will provide for us. Amen. Our world needs the faith of the church to be healed of the strife and violence we have going on. The world out there needs our churches to be healed of self-righteousness, self-centeredness, egoness, this prideful look at me in a prideful way. The world needs us to be what we were called to be, to be called the church, united in one accord, in one mind, in one place. Amen. In one body. We're all into the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have to get ourselves together because for us to be the example to the world, we have to do something different than the world. Unfortunately, it saddens me that I can't turn Facebook on and look at it 
and not see apostolics nitpicking at each other, not seeing other churches nitpicking at each other, constantly calling each other this or that, constantly saying negative things. The world is watching and listening to what you do and you say. And when they hear that, they say, well, their God is a God of confusion and of strife. I wouldn't want that. You're giving them a false impression of who Jesus Christ is. You see, God is not the author of confusion. God is the author of peace. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the one that made it all possible. We need to start acting like Christians, like followers of Christ. And we need to start letting Christ well up and flow out of us so that the world will see the light of Jesus Christ and say, that's what I keep thinking that this should be. That's what I desire. That's what I want. I don't want this sinful lifestyle. I want that peace they have. I want that walk they have with their God. Amen. Other examples of Jehovah Raphi or Jehovah, Jehovah Rophi uh, as his nature, uh, his characteristics. You look at Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7. says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dimmed, nor his natural force abated. In other words, he was in perfect health even when he died, but it was his time to die. God called him home at 120, but he was in perfect health. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 8 and 9. It says, Take heed in the plague of leprosy that thou observest diligently and do according to all that the priest, the Levite, Levite, shall teach you as I commanded them, so ye shall observe to do. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam by the way after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. Remember he put the plague of leprosy upon her because she was murmuring against Moses. But God was faithful to heal when she repented of it, and when Moses asked for her healing, and Aaron asked. First Kings, chapter 17, and verses 17 through 24. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to my remembrance, and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, and carried him up into a loft, where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah as the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is thy mouth, in thy mouth is truth. Church, do you want the world to recognize that we truly are his, that we are truly Christians, that we are truly a child of God? Our actions speak louder than what we say out of our mouth. But our words that we say can also detract from them seeing Jesus. How we speak, what we speak. Are we speaking what God would want us to say? Are we saying what God is telling us to deliver? And are we showing it with our actions? I've known a lot of Christians that were dressed up real nice on the outside, but had a soul that was poison. And because of it, a lot of them no longer serve the Lord. Because you see, their soul never was truly given over to God. They decorated the outside to look the part. 
So the people just left them alone. Oh, look at how holy they are. Look at, they're so perfect and polished. Yet no one ever dug a little deeper to see that beneath all of that fluff, that, that dressing, the window dressing, underneath it all was a heart that was not God's. Had they noticed that, had they done a little bit more paying attention, maybe they could have saved that soul. Maybe they could have helped that person get into a right alignment with God. You see, if you do something that you don't feel convicted of, if you do something you don't really believe, it is hard for you to continue in that throughout your whole walk with God. You have to believe what you are following. And yes, there are people that don't believe when they should believe certain things. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about people that will follow something just because they were told it, but it wasn't necessarily the truth. And I'm not just speaking in the apostolic ranks here, people. I'm talking about all-encompassing. There are a lot of pastors that have led sheep astray, and they will have to answer for that. But there are a lot of pastors that are really good that, that, that pour out their tears for you, that are praying for you, that desire you to have the close walk with God. Sometimes they want you to have the exact walk they have with God. And that's not, that's not necessarily what they should be doing, but you can't fault them because if they've had a great walk with God, they want you to experience it. They're probably not doing it as a negative. They want you to experience what they've experienced. They want you to grow the way they have experienced growth in the Lord. But I want you to understand, if you follow the word of God and you follow after God's will in your life and you commit yourself 100% to Jesus, you can't go wrong. He will not let you be led astray and he will be there to lead you and to guide you. Amen. I'm thankful for a lot of the great pastors that I've had the pleasure of sitting under and to know from the time when I was little until I've gotten older, there's been a great many that still have an impact on my life, that still have a positive role in my life and make a difference. And so it's always very nice. You know, my brother was my pastor for a time and I still go to him and talk to him and ask him questions. And you know, there's pastors like Pastor Vance, like and Pastor Phil Brook, and you know, different pastors throughout my past that I will go to and I will talk to, and I'll say, "Well, what do you think about this?" Or, you know, I'm thinking about speaking on this because it's where I'm feeling, and you know, do you have any uh, words that might uh, help bring this message? And you know, different things like that. And sometimes it's just as simple as saying, I'm praying for you. I know that I have a lot of people praying for me, and I am praying for a lot of people. I am praying for the community I live in, in Plainfield. I'm praying for the pastor of Plainfield Apostolic Church. I'm praying for his family. I'm praying for that church there. I'm praying for the churches in Indianapolis. I'm praying for the churches in Brazil, Indiana. I'm praying for the churches in Brazil. I'm praying for God to move in our churches, to unite us, to get us of one accord and one mind in unity so that we can become a powerful force in the world instead of us trying to all do it on our own separately. Amen. There are so many more examples where we, the Bible shows that God is a healer of not just our physical, but also our spiritual lives. Matthew 4.23. Matthew 4.23 says, And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
You know, before he departed from the apostles, he told them that they would do greater things than he had. And you say, well, how can you do greater things than he did? Well, because we're endued with his power. He has given us the power of attorney to have the power to, to pray for people to be healed, to pray for uh, spiritual forces to be defeated when they're coming against us. And there are all of us that are saved is a whole lot more than just one person. And so we're able to go out and do these things. But why are we able to do it? Because of Jesus. Amen. Because of what Jesus did. Church, let's be what God called us to be. Let's be a place of healing. Let's be a place of safety. Let's be a place of forgiveness and reconciliation. A place of healing for both the spiritual and physical needs of the people. Church, it is time to repent of our rebellious, self-centered, self-righteous ways and our pride. It is time to get back to where we need to be. We need to hit our knees at the altar of forgiveness, at the throne room of God, and say, God, I allowed myself vanity. I allowed my pride, my self-centeredness, my self-righteousness, my judgmentalness. I allowed it to control and consume me, and I missed where my, my calling was. You would call me to be a witness, a light, a testimony of who you are. You called me to give this message. You told me to bring them in to pray with them so that they could repent of their sin. But you did not tell me to be harsh to them. You did not tell me to be hateful to them. You didn't tell me to fight with my brothers and my sisters in the Lord. Lord, forgive the sin. Forgive the rebellion and work in me, Lord Jesus. Make me what you desire me to be. Make me a great soul winner. Make me a great light and testimony of who you are. Hallelujah. Give God the glory. Give God the honor. Look, I want you to praise God in every situation. I don't care what's coming down the pike at you. I don't care what obstacle, what challenge, what trial you're going through. The Bible says in everything, give thanks. Lift your voice and praise Him. It says to clap and to dance for Him. Hallelujah. We are to give God His glory and honor that He is due. Hallelujah. The time is now. If we want to see our world delivered, if we want to see our land healed, if we want to see some semblance of normalcy in our life, it is time for us to get ourselves in the place of reconciliation with God. To say, Lord, I allowed myself to be caught up in this situation. I allowed myself to be like this. Lord, forgive me of it. Lord, use me. Let your light shine through me for this world. I don't know about you, but I cry for the lost. I cry for those that are going to a hell. Because a lot of them have bought this, this lie that there is no hell. They've bought this lie that they don't have to worry. But there is a very real hell. California thinks they know what hell is because their land is on fire. Oregon, their land is on fire. My friends... It is nothing compared to the torture that hell will be. Turn your life to God today. If you're in church and you've been experiencing any of the things that I've talked about, you probably didn't try to be that. You probably didn't try. You probably were being well-meaning and well-intentioned with what you were doing. But if you were convicted by this message, I, I implore you, Ask God to forgive you today. All the organizations and all the independent churches, we need to get together in unity. We need to learn to worship together. When I had my church building, I reached out to multiple churches, independent and different apostolic organizations. And do you know that they did not come together to worship they did not come together to be unified, to have a revival service. There was one that was willing. Unfortunately, we, we never get the chance to while we had our church building. We will again soon have a church building. I am trusting God's will for this church. 
But until we do have a church building again, we will continue to deliver the word of God in any way possible. We will deliver this message out there. Amen. We will have church and we will give the Lord his glory and his honor. We will not sit on the sidelines. We will not be dissuaded. We will not get discouraged because I know the call and I know what God said. And I will faithfully serve him in all things. Follow 2 Chronicles 7.14 today. The time is now for our world faces certain doom sooner rather than later. I believe we can buy ourselves a space of time to continue this message, to continue our work here. But we have to be in a unified body and before the Lord seeking his face. Lord, I just thank you today. Hallelujah. I praise you and lift you up. Lord, I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would work in a mighty way. Lord Jesus, Lord, work amongst your church. Lord Jesus, Lord, let us become more unified. Lord Jesus, let the church dwell together in unity. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, I pray that we would be able to come together to lift one another up, to support one another, to encourage, to exhort. Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just have your way in the life of me. Lord Jesus, in my life, in my family's life, in this church. Lord, you know what you want for us, Lord Jesus. You know what you've called for us, Lord Jesus. Lord, you just open up the doorways, Lord, for us, and Lord, we will be there for you. Lord, we lift you up and praise you today. We give you glory and honor today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I pray for our country, Lord. I pray for our officials, Lord, our elected officials. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them guidance, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you are able to reach those that are, Lord, so decrepit in their way of living, Lord Jesus, because, Lord, we once also were the same way. Lord, not let us to be judgmental towards them, but, Lord, let us have a heart of compassion, a heart of caring, Lord Jesus. Lord, to pour out our heart to you, Lord Jesus, that their souls might be saved. Lord, I thank you and praise you today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, Go with the people that have heard this message, Lord. Go with this message, Lord. Deliver this message far and wide. Lord, I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We will see you again on Wednesday. I pray that you would take this message to heart. It is time to allow God to do what God does to heal our land.